Stanford University. Well, thanks very much, Miriam. It's uh, really a great pleasure and honor to be here. It's uh, interesting in walking in and looking around the room. Um, I know a lot of people here because um, many of you have been funded by NIMH, and some of you have been colleagues over many, many years. But I don't think I've ever seen all of you in the same room at the same time, which I suppose is the, the idea of forming this institute and how exciting that is. When um, the idea for this symposium got hatched uh, some months ago, Bill asked me if I'd um, participate to give kind of a high level, I'm not sure high level is the right term, but uh, sort of a, a view of the field from uh, 30,000 feet to talk about uh, where are we, where do we need to go, and to think a little bit about a uh, topic which I'll call from neurons to neighborhoods uh, to see if we can sort of chart our course. And this will be quite different from uh, what you've already heard from Bruce and John. This is actually a, uh, a little bit more about um, uh, directions and strategy maybe than uh, the nitty gritty details of experiments. I want to start off uh, in sort of a call to action by um, talking to you about the really remarkable good news of what biomedical research has been able to deliver to the public in so many different ways. And I'm going to just focus on biomedical research and what it's done in a public health sense for measures of mortality. We just don't talk about this enough. And people tend not to realize that in the last few decades, um, besides the increase in longevity, which has gone from 47 to 79 or so in the last century, there have been some really very specific, phenomenal successes. When I was a medical student, acute lymphoblastic leukemia was the most common cancer of children, and it was 95% of the time fatal. Today, it's cured at a 95% rate, um, about, what is that, 6,000 deaths averted every year for this most common cancer of childhood. Another example, which again, we don't often recognize, is that um, there's been about a 63% reduction in mortality from heart disease. That, uh, if you just do the graph from uh, the trajectory of what we were expecting from the 60s and 70s, that means that there are over a million deaths averted every year from heart disease based on findings from research. AIDS, I think people know there's a 50% reduction in mortality. Last year, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services relabeled AIDS as a chronic disease, something which would have been unimaginable just 15 years ago. Uh, even within the brain, uh, stroke has got about a 30% reduction in mortality. And if you can get into the emergency room within three hours of onset, you will walk out of the emergency room without sequela if you receive one of the clot busting drugs. That's pretty phenomenal. So these are just a few examples of the places where we've had these terrific successes measured with this very hard outcome of mortality. And that's pretty terrific. What is maybe not so terrific is that we're not doing so well in many of the brain disorders. Suicide is an example where really over the last few decades, uh, rather than seeing a decrease as we have with these other uh, disorders, there's actually, if anything, an increase or a slight, you could say it's gone up and down a little bit, but the most recent numbers continue to trend up. Um, that's 90% uh, of the time thought to be related to having a mental illness, most often depression, schizophrenia, bipolar. It's an amazing contrast to homicide, which is another, used to be an equal source of mortality in this country. Homicides come down about 50% as have traffic fatalities, and yet suicide continues to be a major source of mortality. I mean, if you do the math, that's kind of phenomenal. There are 39,000 suicides in this country every year. That's twice the number of homicides, which is really quite extraordinary. And it means that we lose more people to suicide than almost any form of cancer except for colon, lung, and breast. Everything else has less than 39,000 deaths a year. This is a huge, huge public health problem, which we don't really talk much about. Of course, when we think about brain disorders broadly, it's not just mortality that we care about. And when we think about public health impact, we're not just interested in mortality. We're interested in morbidity. Morbidity is hard to measure. But we do that these days through a measure 
sort of a one of these uh, aggregated statistics called the DALI, the Disability Adjusted Life Year, com combining the premature mortality and actual years lost to disability. When you do that, as you can see in this graph, what's quite surprising is that brain disorders, mental and behavioral ones here and neurologic here, are actually the largest source of disability, of morbidity now, not just mortality, more than heart disease and cancer and uh, other major, major uh, biomedical challenges. This wasn't always the case, but it has become the case. And in this era of dealing with chronic, non-communicable diseases, these disorders are emerging as the major public health challenge. For the mental disorders, uh, mental and behavioral disorders, part of the reason why they're, they're driving these numbers is because they start early in life. 75% of adults with a mental illness will describe onset by age 24, 50% by age 14. And for that reason, when you actually look at the data for morbidity, for disability, you can see these are the ages by uh, five-year increments here that actually this red line, which is the mental and behavioral disorders, you're driving virtually all of the medical disability up until about age 50. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we don't actually think about this very often, but these are the chronic disorders of young people and the largest source of medical challenge, biomedical challenge, compared to, you could actually at age 40, you could add all of these other sources together and you still don't get up to where we are with mental and behavioral disorders. It's not just mortality and morbidity that we care about, it's also, we have to talk about cost at some point because that is such a driver, at least in the American healthcare system. Uh, a few years back, the World Economic Forum, that's the group that meets in Davos every January and now in China every September, got together and said, um, healthcare, especially chronic non-communicable diseases are gonna become a really big challenge, not only in the developed world, but in the developing world. How big of a challenge will that be? And they decided to look at diabetes and um, chronic respiratory diseases, cancer and heart disease. And just for kicks, because they needed a control group, they threw in mental illness. And much to their amazement, as you can see here, actually mental illness was, um, turned out to be the trump card. It was actually the largest cost altogether. You can see the numbers in 2010 was estimated to be $2.5 trillion annually in US dollars, going up to something like 6 trillion by their projection by 2030, which is really phenomenal. That's how you get these enormous numbers. Just in the US alone, the numbers just for serious mental illness, even a few years back, were exceeding $300 billion a year. So these are enormous costs. And what makes them even more extraordinary is that unlike a lot of the other costs that we're seeing in medicine, these are all on the public dollar side. So serious mental illness is virtually all paid for by Medicaid, Medicare, 85% of people with schizophrenia are unemployed. So these enormous costs for SSI and welfare and for what we would call indirect costs. In young people, this is a huge social problem. Absolutely not just huge, but it's going to become one of the largest problems that will prevent developing countries from fully developing and it will prevent developed countries from being able to reach even the economic standards that we expect. The flip side of all this is what's happening demographically. And you see that when you talk about Alzheimer's disease. So here's the other side of brain disorders, not now the mental illnesses that are largely the disorders that begin early in life, but here we're talking about diseases that are neurodegenerative and we think about as late life. And you can see from this graph that as we project out what we're talking about, even though currently there are about 5 million people with, uh, with Alzheimer's disease, it's kind of amazing actually, one in eight over 65, but it's one in three over 85. So this is really common. But what's happening is that because of change in demographics, this is becoming also a huge driver. So that even though now the figures are around $200, million, $200 billion a year, that's expected to surpass a trillion dollars by 2050. What's interesting about this graph is people have calculated what would happen if, and this is the dark bars, if you could just forestall the onset by five years, and you could see that even if you don't cure it and don't prevent it, 
just by slowing the progression, you could have an enormous economic impact. But to understand this, you really have to look at what's happening to our nation in terms of demography. And it is really kind of an extraordinary story. 1965, 9% 9 of people over age 65. And you can see that now it's up to 14% and will soon be at 20 or, and even above 21%. Um, it's maybe even easier to see here when you look at what parts of the population are growing fastest. And you can see it's the over 65 in this decade and the next that are gonna be the real drivers. And um, memo to any Stanford administrators who are thinking about how to keep this uh, university healthy, this is your market. This is, the, this is the news, these are the students of the future, our people over 65. This is the largest, by far, fastest growing part of our population. But that's also the challenge when you think about Alzheimer's and when you think about neurodegenerative diseases, because obviously um, we're on the wrong side of history here unless we can do something about this. So here's the message. These kinds of diseases are going to be, for the 21st century, what infectious diseases were in the 20th century. Brain disorders are the most disabling and the most costly of these chronic non-communicable diseases. And yet, we do not know enough about the brain to be able to address the challenge that's in front of us. Or to put this another way, quoting one of my favorite scientists, Jerry Garcia, somebody has to do something and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. <laughs> I showed this uh, slide to my wife recently and she said, you can't show that. That sounds, <laughs> she said, what about that Hopi Elder slide? We are the ones we've been waiting for. I said, ah, everybody's heard that. So this is actually, Jerry got, had it just right. I mean. There isn't anybody else who's gonna do this. This is, it's up to us. And the world is waiting, and this is really a big problem. So here's the, here's the challenge. We've gotta figure out how to do this. And it is rather pathetic that it's gonna be left to us, because we don't, even though we may be smart, we don't have great tools. And that's what I wanna talk about, because I think where the challenge here for the next few years has got to be is coming up with a way to be able to do this better than what we've been doing. You've heard great science already this afternoon, but I think even our previous speakers would agree with me that we don't want in 2020 and 2030 to be dealing with only the toolbox we've got now. And in fact, that's true at every level. And, and this is going to be a multi-level challenge. So, Building on the Jerry Garcia concept, what I'd like to share with you is another favorite quote, which is actually from a real scientist, an astrophysicist from Harvard, uh, Freeman Dyson, who, um, coming from astrophysics, has a very good sense of the importance of having better and better telescopes. New directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways, the effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have to be explained. I think that's actually very apt for where we are in this field. And the useful thing to recognize is that even in the last five years, we have come pretty far in developing at every level some really interesting new opportunities. The toolbox is getting better virtually on a I would say a couple of every two to three months, there's something new coming along. I'm not gonna be able to summarize all of those different areas, though that would uh, take the rest of the afternoon, but I wanna focus just on systems because this is gonna be for the Neurosciences, Neurosciences Institute, I think probably the key place you wanna live. And there, just to give you a taste of the sorts of things, some of which you've already heard, but that are worth thinking about. Certainly, we've got some pretty cool tools right now for doing brain structure in a way that we couldn't before. Brainbow is a nice way of disentangling complex areas using uh, multiple fluorophores to be able to identify individual neurons and their projections in a way that we could not do uh, a decade ago. And that is an enormous advance. Uh, the contribution from uh, Carl's lab of clarity and being able to think about 3D anatomy uh, 
uh, is going to be, I think, transformative, not just for the brain, but for other organ systems as well. And you've already heard about in terms of structural changes, looking at um, the wiring diagram, as Bruce described it, um, uh, from the Human Connectome Project, to be able to look with much, much higher resolution, including at those very complicated areas where you have crossing fibers, to begin to look at what the human brain looks like. It may be even more stunning now to be able to think about what we can do in terms of function. And the recent evidence using now light sheet microscopy from Genelia, from Aaron's and, and their colleagues, to be able to look at virtually every neuron in real time as it fires in a zebrafish larva, awake, behaving, and to begin to try to ask questions like, what do these patterns mean? What is this? You get these blasts of activity every now and then. What is that about? What is the language that this little fish is using to make sense of the world and to get around in the world? I'll let it go a little bit longer so you can see this blast point. Right, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Somewhere in there, the whole thing lights up. Ah, there it is. So, so that's, you know, it's, I think we're at a point where we now have the tools to begin to look at those kinds of issues. I don't know if Mark Schnitzer and his folks from his lab are here, but there's a, you know, really a very analogous example of Mark's work uh, using, um, uh, in this case, calcium imaging to look at place cells with one of his microendoscopes to be able to go right into the hippocampus and look at a mouse in an eight-arm radio arm maze as he runs around and to try to see what, how is space and place being encoded. This is a good week to be talking about this. Got a Nobel Prize for this kind of work this week. But what John O'Keefe and, and what the Mosers have done, which is spectacular, is to lay out you know, what the grid looks like and where the cells are. But what I think Mark is giving us and his colleagues is this dynamic picture for the first time to see what's the code. Could we take this pattern and reverse engineer it and use that to describe where the mouse is? Well, almost. We're making real progress there. And the same kind of an approach when we talk about function to think about in human imaging. And this is the work, again, from the Human Connectome Project, from Camille Ugerbill and colleagues, to look at these, these transient networks that are co-activated during the resting state. Is there a code embedded there? Is there meaning? And how can we make sense of that? So given those kinds of advances over the last very short period, maybe three to five years, um, not surprising that people felt this was the time to really make a major commitment. And the president announced in April of 2013 this idea of the Human Brain Project, uh, which the Brain Initiative Project, I should say, uh, the next great American project. What he meant by next was he was, I think, thinking about the Human Genome Project as the last great American project, but he didn't actually specify that, um, assuming that it was, it was something scientific, but we don't actually know that. Uh, but look at the quote. It's kind of, uh, it's very inspiring because what President Obama did was to sort of take a page from Freeman, Dyson, and others by saying what he wants is to give scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action. So sort of reading the language of the brain at the speed of thought. That's the concept. What will we need to do that? Where is the information encoded? And from, from my perspective, that's a really tough problem. And I want to just give you sort of three angles on this which make it particularly tough. One is that we don't really know what the right scale is. So a lot of our advances are kind of at this end of the spectrum where we can, like in the nematode with 304 neurons, begin to look at every one of them. Same sort of thing that I showed you with the zebrafish. You know, you could actually begin to get some information about the coding system there, but how well that will translate to these other kinds of systems when you're going across nine orders of magnitude isn't really entirely clear yet. It's also not clear whether the information that we care about is being encoded at the level of synapses or at the level of individual or clusters of neurons or really in a kind of macro way through oscillations and very large changes over longer periods of time 
uh, in, in the cortex and subcortical areas. We actually, it's kind of amazing. I mean, I, I always have to explain this when I try to argue for our budget uh, in Congress, and I have to do that, uh, and I do that very unsuccessfully, I should say, but, but I do it anyway. And I always try to explain that we know so much less about the brain than we know about the heart or the kidney. I mean, it's kind of astonishing. We know that this is an information processing organ, like the heart's a pump and the kidney's a filter, but we don't have a clue even about what level that information is processed and how to, how to do it. Now, we are, I have to say, with the tools we've got, we've got lots of advances, but still much of what we do well is kind of static, and clearly the code is dynamic. It's all about time, and we don't yet even know what the right temporal domain is for that. On the structural side, and this is kind of question number two, we've thought a lot about getting the map, the, the connectome, and of course there are great arguments that take place within the community between whether we need this, this micro, the macro connectome, which you heard about from Bruce, or the micro connectome, and which one is more important, and I think most of us now think that we need both and, and everything in between. I'll say more about that in a moment. And then trying to get the right at least with human imaging, trying to get the right level of both spatial and temporal resolution is really a challenge. And some of the questions to Bruce at the end about, you know, how far can you push this are sort of what we're struggling with generically. We actually don't know how far we can push the current methods for both spatial and temporal resolution. We think we can get a lot of mileage by combining them and doing multimodal imaging where you put lots of different things together. But Beware, because we do so much around bold, for instance, which is way out here. This is the bold signal, which evolves because it's all blood flow over many, many seconds. But the actual ERP or the actual electrical signal is going over you know, a few milliseconds. So we're, we're a couple of orders of magnitude, at least, off when we try to tie those two together. We got a problem we're still not where we need to be in terms of the tools that we have. Now, the brain initiative to get really launched in the right way, we decided we'd bring in a lot of very smart people, many of whom are in the room. The group was led by, uh, by Bill and by Corey Bargman. And, and they said, yeah, you know, this macro connectome and micro connectome are kind of neat, but what we really need is this meso connectome, something in the middle. Um, they put together this terrific uh, report Brain 2025, a scientific vision. I, I do a lot of reading. I think this is one of the best things I've read in 2014. I would highly recommend it to everybody in the audience, especially if you ever plan to get funded by NIH. This, <laughs> this is a really good thing to read. Uh, all of the NIH brain directors have read this and talk about it and think about it, and every time we reread it, we see something we didn't even know was there. So it's a, it's a really marvelous document. It's a little long, and hopefully we'll have a shorter version at some point. Note to Bill. Yes, yes? okay. Uh, but but this, is the, this is sort of the take home, which is that the, the goal here is to map the circuits, measure the fluctuating patterns of activity within those circuits, and understand how they create these unique cognitive and behavioral capabilities. This is so easy to say and so hard to do. We really don't even know how. But what a fantastic mission. What a fantastic goal. And hopefully that will take place by bringing what we know at this level macro, at this level micro, and the sort of meso level in between. The, one of the hopes for this, if we could ever do it correctly, would be something like, um, what you'll see, I think, in this video, as it shows, and this is work from the BrainGate group, Lee Hochberg and uh, John Donahue, in which by understanding that language, the way in which the brain is encoding information, they could take someone who, in this case, is this woman who's been paralyzed. She's quadriplegic. She can move her head, but neither her arms or legs. And she has a, uh, about 100 neurons being recorded in her premotor cortex which have trained up a computer algorithm to then drive this robotic arm. And for the first time, she's using her thoughts about movement, about reach and grasp, to be able to drive the arm, to be able to get a drink of coffee. 
And again, by thinking about the movement, and this has required a significant amount of training, she can drive the robotic arm back and voila. Now, the goal is not this. The goal, of course, would be to drive her own arm at some point because her arm is perfectly functional. It's just not connected. But figuring out how to do that is a lot of the, where we think the ultimate hope of being able to decode that language really resides. So I'm going to finish up in just a couple of minutes by saying that there is sort of an embedded inconvenient truth here which is in spite of all that we've done recently and all that we're hoping to do, um, we're still not really bending the curve, uh, I think, uh, for people with serious mental illness. These are, you know, <laughs> we've got great stuff and great papers, but um, it doesn't yet seem to make a difference for people with autism or schizophrenia. And I'm going to argue that if we want to do that, we're going to have to completely transform the way that we take neuroscience and put it into clinical practice. So um, one option is that actually the field that today is called psychiatry could actually be reframed as clinical neuroscience. And the way this could work is that you'd begin to think about diagnosis very differently. In this case, um, diagnosis is really more about biology and cognition as well as behavior. So. Um, this is a place where we need just the very best of cognitive science as well as the very best in biological sciences. If we think about therapeutics, we want to be able to move from the idea that these are sort of um, your quart low in serotonin when you're depressed to thinking much more about this being a circuit problem and that treatments then are more about how do we tune circuits and make a, a difference. And finally, the culture of neuroscience or the culture of science will need to change as well. Uh, and I want to say a bit about open science and why we think that's so important. On the, on the, in the case of diagnosis, really across all of these issues from neurons to neighborhoods, actually we may say, maybe we should say molecules to neighborhoods, we've got, I think, lots of ways now of pulling out new data beyond just observable behavior that will give us, I think, a much more precise way of defining What's wrong with people who used to be called depressed or used to be called schizophrenic? There may be 25 forms of schizophrenia and, and who knows how many forms of depression and they may require very different treatments, but we can't do that until we begin to collect these kinds of data. We know this from cancer, we know this from many other parts of medicine. The same with, um, as we look at therapeutics, the, the, going across every one of these levels, and realizing that there isn't going to be a magic bullet, there's not a pill that's going to be the right answer for any of the disorders we care about. What it's going to require is a kind of network approach that brings all of these together in a way that actually makes the most difference. And there's been a lot written about this rate recently, whether we call it um, beyond magic bullets or network solutions, trying to find ways of taking the kinds of tools that we now have and applying them in the clinic to begin to tune circuits and to get people to recover. Finally, uh, about the culture itself, which I think is really a challenge, and maybe the hardest of the three things that need to transform. There is an enormous frustration in the public that we haven't done better. Uh, I hear this literally every day, whether it's parents with, autism, with a kid with autism or um, people with a relative with severe depression or someone who's lost a child to suicide. They're just enormously frustrated with how long it takes and how little we've been able to um, translate uh, all this very cool science into changes that they can um, they actually realize. And the argument here is that the way this has to happen is that the whole ecosystem for how we do science has to change. That, um, and it is changing, that everybody has a role in this. Um, that it's a whole series now of these collaborative efforts that bring these various components together. But the really fundamental change is that, and it's going to make a difference for people in this institute, I think, is that we have to think about what we do with data. I mean, in, in, in the information age, data are really the coin of the realm. And the extent to which we can standardize, integrate, and share is one of the ways in which we can be somewhat confident that things could go along much more quickly. It also solves a number of other problems.
by creating more transparency in the science we do. So open science is, I think, um, very much a mantra that you'll be hearing more of from NIH and that I hope becomes something that folks here can adopt and, and promote. So to summarize what I've told you, brain disorders are going to be the major public health challenge of the next century, of this century. To address this, we're going to need new tools, uh, tools that will help us to decode the language of the brain from neurons to neighborhoods, and we need to be able to translate those into public health benefit. Uh, and that really comes at those three levels, diagnosis, therapeutics, and changing this culture of discovery through open science. I'll finish with one last quote, which I think is probably timely for all of you, because uh, much of what we're talking about is really how things will go in the future. And I wanted to share this one, which I use a lot, from uh, Bill Gates. We've gone, we've gone a long way here from Jerry Garcia to Bill Gates. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. I think that's a good guide, uh, that um, there are going to be enormous shifts, partly driven by the toolbox that will be created here and elsewhere. We need to adapt that, adopt that, and to really promote that so that it's not only giving us cool papers, but actually giving us something that will also make a difference for um, the public. Thanks very much for your attention. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.